Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kaiser Guo, and I am the host, as uh, you just heard, from the, of the Seneca podcast, which is a weekly conversation of current affairs uh, in China coming from the China Project. This is a really good time to be convening a panel, albeit a very brief one necessarily, on China and the future of security. Security is surely something that's very much top of mind for Xi Jinping and for the rest of the Chinese Communist Party's leadership uh, just a month out from the 20th Party Congress, uh, which will convene on October 16th. Uh, and that follows on really what's been a rough year, both domestically and in foreign policy. A year ago, Xi Jinping was positively brimming with confidence. Uh, the party leadership seemed to have not merely survived, but probably to have emerged stronger from a series of pretty battering stress tests, systemic stress tests, uh, the trade war, of course, uh, the technology cold war, the you know, deprivation of key tech inputs from the United States and from some of its allies. Uh, there was the sort of international opprobrium that China had suffered because of Xinjiang and because of uh, the Hong Kong, or the sort of taming of Hong Kong and the national security law. Uh, and of course, uh, they, they've, there was the, the COVID pandemic. But coming out of that, that uh, they felt like not only had they they endured it, but they had actually come out with increased popular support, uh, increased sort of a sense of regime regid- le- regime legitimacy. Uh, and, you know, they felt positioned to now undertake uh, some some pretty big moves to pull the Band-Aids off and to address some of the, the, the deeper underlying problems that have bedeviled China for, for some years. Uh, you know, to break eggs and, you, and make an omelet. Uh, and so, they, you know, they really wanted to uh, ad- address their vulnerabilities in, in core technologies like semiconductors to try to, you know, win the future in AI, to really, you know, curb the power of these powerful tech platforms, um, you know, to kind of put China onto a new kind of post-carbon footing uh, with electric vehicles and, and other green tech. Uh, the program was... and make no mistake, it, it was a program, uh, was being called, you know, Common Prosperity. Uh, my colleagues and I at the China Project had another name for it. We were calling it the Red New Deal. Things are looking, though, very, very different for Xi Jinping right now. The Omicron variants have buffeted uh, China's economy as Xi's zero COVID approach uh, held up as evidence of, you know, tremendous state capacity just a year ago is now widely seen of pro- as proof of his inflexibility uh, economic security, that even food security are sort of back on the table. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has strengthened the transatlantic alliance. It's uh, casting, you know, the Quad and AUKUS in a new light and making all the more conspicuous Beijing's dearth of any respectable allies, really, um, even as this crisis looms in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, it's it's early to be sure, but it does appear that China's big push toward high tech self sufficiency is also already encountering considerable difficulties. Uh, the common prosperity agenda is on the back burner, if not completely on hold. What should we l- l- make then of, of what's happening with the Party Congress, uh, and what can we expect from this third Xi Jinping term, which is all but certain? Now, I am really delighted to be in, to introduce this outstanding panel. Uh, we've got Ling Ling Wei, who's a veteran reporter for the Wall Street Journal, who recently came back to the United States after uh, being in China for many years. She's the co-author of the outstanding book, Superpower Showdown, which chronicles the Trump trade war. Uh, Ling Ling, great to see you again. Thank you, Kaiser. Uh, we've also got Kendra Schaefer, who is head of tech policy research for Beijing-based consultancy Trivium. Uh, she's really one of the go-to people who... Uh, I, I turn to when I want to understand China's tech regulation, and she can be counted on for really deeply informed and very highly original perspectives. So welcome, Kendra. Great to have you. Good to be here. And uh, we're also joined by my dear friend Damian Ma, who is the managing director and co-founder of Macro Polo, the think tank of the Paulson Institute, and also a go-to person I re- to understand really, for me, the ins and outs of elite politics in China uh, and much more. Great to, to have you on, Damian. Always good to be with you, Kaiser. All right, Lingling, let me, let me start with you. Uh, you have been making the point in a lot of your reporting that Xi is not the omnipotent ruler uh, that he's often made out to be and that there actually have been challenges to his authority. Uh, what has this uh, terribly challenging year for him revealed about the limits to Xi Jinping's power? And, and how should we try to right-size the actual control, the actual you know, uh, power that he does wield in China? Because that is not inconsiderable. Sure, Kaiser. Um, great to be here. 
if we look back on what Xi Jinping has done in the past decade, undoubtedly he's accomplished a great deal of consolidation of political power. You know, he now has firm control over hard power institutions like the military and the domestic security apparatus. He overturned the way China had been ruled since, since Deng Xiaoping. Mm -hmm. When you look at the political standing committee, the party chief used to be a kind of first among equals, uh, but she has made himself the chairman of everything. So by all those measures, he is very powerful. However, if you look at how successful he has been in terms of implementing his agenda, especially in the economic arena, you see the limits to his power. Mm -hmm. For instance, you pointed out the common prosperity agenda, right? That's what he promoted last year. It has hurt private sector sentiment badly, making entrepreneurs feeling unsafe and unwilling to make investments. So he has had to pull back from that agenda. The common prosperity slogan that was everywhere last year has been barely mentioned this year. It's probably one of the most noticeable setbacks she has had encountered in recent years. Then you also see him pulling back from, or at least hitting the pause button on this near blanket crackdown on the private tax sector, mm -hmm. even though pressure on those private firms still remains. In addition, he has had to also to walk back from some very ambitious energy targets after severe power short shortage last year. So in short, yes, she is immensely powerful, but he doesn't have absolute power and he's still constrained by China's political system and economic reality. Right, right, right. Uh, Damien, 2022, as I said, didn't exactly go as she had envisioned. Uh, what is your take on the extent, if any, to which this has actually weakened him politically as he goes into this party congress. Is he going to face any kind of challenge? In, in, in... Well, I think um, he has certainly bundled, I think, the handling of, of uh, you know, the COVID approach. Um, now, the question is whether um, the perpetuation of the zero COVID approach is actually going to, uh, you know, uh, exact serious you know collateral damage to, to, Tim, to him politically doesn't look like it at this point especially i think if our assumption is that he walks in and he wins his third term that pretty much shows that uh, that yeah yes there, there there's probably some controversy and, and damage but ultimately uh, you know i think he's got a bit of a teflon um, um, feature on him where things kind of just slip you know slip off a little bit and so uh it doesn't look like it's 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 really hurt him significantly um, but I think if you were to point out one thing to kind of, you know, uh, criticize him for um, over the year is it is the handling of, of the economy. And I think that's the question on, on a lot of people's minds, on markets, on businesses is, you know, when is this, when will there be a plan B? Not even when the zero COVID policy will be lifted, but will there be a plan B or are we just going to see whack-a-mole lockdowns as far as far as the eye can see? And that's a, that, that's a huge problem. And we all know that you know chinese economy is not just being hit by zero COVID, but they also have to manage a property crisis so right. they're getting hit on, on 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 two fronts and and this is uh, hugely problematic uh, at least two fronts there's also the tech component and we get into that but at as we speak months. xi jinping is actually headed to the fabled silk road city of samarkand uh in uzbekistan for the summit of the shanghai cooperation organization he's going to kazakhstan first uh, what do you see as the significance of the fact that he's finally taking a trip abroad. And actually, he's got, uh, you know, this is the first one since the pandemic started, but th there are a few more on his schedule coming up. Um, I understand that, you know, people are, are, are starting to, to speculate, does this mean maybe that zero COVID might finally be coming to an end if the dear leader is, is traveling? I think it's probably one of the most positive signs we've seen in in about two years, and it's not just Xi Jinping, right? Li John True, another Politburo standing committee right. member, has also travel outside of the country. So uh, yes, yes, and she has plans to I think go 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 to G20 uh, later this year in Jakarta, right. uh, where she might meet with President Biden. So this is probably one one of the best signs we've seen. But again, going to my previous point is, uh, I th I think you know knowing knowing how, knowing the Chinese approach, they're not just going to sort of lift 
zero COVID with one fell, you know, one fell swoop. It's not going to happen that way. Um, but I think what they can do is they should lay out some sort of exit plan or plan B where they say, here are these, you know, here's sort of the next phase of how we are going to deal with this uh, policy. And maybe it's, you know, uh, low hanging fruit, like getting rid of some of the more, you know, uh, stringent uh, quarantine uh, 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 policies. But step by step, they need to sort of give them a bit more confidence that what we see is not what we're going to get for another 12 months. Yeah. And that that I think will naturally uh, imbue some confidence, I think, in businesses and markets and also in the economy. Ling Ling, uh, same with you. I mean, Ling Ling and David Namian have a hard stop in just 15 minutes, so I'm, I've got to stack questions for them first. But is there any likelihood, Ling Ling, that Xi Jinping will anoint a successor next month? That I mean, see, Xi himself, as we probably all know, is, uh, he was kind of anointed in 2007, and that was sort of the norm. Uh, he would be next in line as the general secretary uh, five years before he actually took office, uh, until, of course, she broke from that. Um, how would we know? If we're watching the party Congress and its proceedings, how would we know if a successor had been tapped? And and would that signal clearly that she intended this term to be his last? Sure. Um, that's certainly an indication of the strength of Xi Jinping's power. Um, I think one sign of whether or not he will name a successor uh, is to see who becomes the next vice president. Right. Is the position currently occupied by Wang Qishan? If someone much younger gets that position in Xi's next term, that person might be seen as a you know potential successor. But it's a bit hard to believe all she wants is just one more term. So even if he agrees to name successor now, it can still change as he continues to try to secure and strengthen his power. I just wanted to add one more quick follow up point to what Damien just said, and I completely agree that you know uh, the challenge uh, uh, to She's leadership per se, you know, is very limited. But but I do want to uh, emphasize that there have been challenges to his authority, especially in terms of the economic management. And those challenges coming from the more pragmatic and techno, uh, technocratic side of the party, in particular, his number two, Premier Li Keqiang, and his underlings at the state council. You know, as we know, the premier and the government system he has overall have seen their their power weakened significantly for most of the past decade. And, um, you know, President Xi, as we said earlier, has taken personal charge of the economy, among other key levers of power, and has overturned division of labor between the party and the government. However, there's still a mechanism for forces like the premier to challenge Xi's authority on economic issues. And they have done that through state council inspections. So one thing to be on the lookout for in terms of the upcoming party Congress, in terms of final results, is not, not you know, it's obviously, you know, she taking control of the top leadership position again, and also in the makeup of the uh, standing committee and whether or not he will have to make certain concessions on key personnel like the premier, executive vice premier, and whether or not you know, he has to, will have to make uh, any concessions on policy pri priorities going forward. Speaking of the the composition of the standing committee, um, looking at the the the, the um, central committee and the Politburo, you know the twenty five member Politburo and the three hundred odd people in the central committee, it, it it's very clear that technocrats are on the ascent. Mm -hmm. So Kendra, we have seen uh, many many appointments of graduates of Beihang, uh, formerly the Beijing University of Aerospace mm -hmm. and Astronautics, uh, rising through the ranks in the pre party Congress round of provincial appointments. Um, this seems very significant. Uh, this is very different than what we saw in the, in the 18th and the 19th Party Congress, where uh, they were sort of technocrats were out of fashion. What, what's your take on what this means for Beijing's priorities or, or the policy direction uh, that we might expect coming uh, in the next five years? Yeah, well, I mean, Kaiser, I don't think it'll surprise anyone if I say Beijing is leaning very heavily on um, technology and innovation policy to cure kind of a whole host of social ills, right? Both uh, international and domestic, right? And that's a trend that is guaranteed to continue and definitely going to ramp up. Um, you know, most obviously, it's clear that getting China out from, you know, what's kind of perceived to be the the, the boot heel of Western sanctions on advanced technologies uh, via indigenous innovation 
um, has become one of China's, you know, top three policy priorities, right? That's true in all kinds of areas, uh, chips, satellite navigation and aerospace, et cetera, right? So uh, Be Be Beijing is putting policymakers in place that understand the importance of that competition uh, and hopefully have the capabilities to move that forward, right? So the, the competition over advanced technologies is heating up. But uh, we'll also see technology leaned on more heavily um, as a solution to a kind of host of domestic problems, right? Mm. We see that all the time. If, for example, uh, China's got this looming aging population crisis, right, which has has the potential to, to threaten food security over the next 20 years um, as, as China's older farming generation kind of ages out of the profession and isn't replaced. Right. I, I think the average age of the Chinese farmer is really high. It's something like 50, right, 55. Uh, and kids don't want to go into the fields. Uh, anymore. They want to go to the cities and, and do other work or go online. And so there's a question of who's going to going to till the field, you know, 20 years from now. Um, and when you don't have enough farmers, you kind of have two options, right? You have immigration or automation. Um, and China already doesn't have a great immigration policy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when you have a bunch of bureaucrats in place, uh, technocrats specifically, making agricultural policy, um, and the options are immigrants or robots, it's going to be robots, right? Yeah. You're going to see all of that policy support go into, um, you know, next generation technologies that can solve that social problem. We see that everywhere. We see it in COVID, um, you know, obviously the the and the entire health system and and um, almost every other sector, autos, environment, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that influences having those people in place influences policy in a number of ways. We'll come back to uh, a little more on technology in just a bit, but um, I want to shift and talk a little bit about China's foreign policy. And let me just throw this one out to whoever wants it. Uh, will we likely see any shift in, in Xi's foreign policy during his third term? I mean, China has some seriously fraught foreign relations and not just with the U.S. Uh, we have, of course, the Ukraine war that's ongoing, and it's, it's really found it very difficult to maintain what I've described as a pro-Russian neutrality uh, what what do we expect to see in terms of foreign policy direction? Maybe we'll start with you, Lingling, Ling, and then Damien, you can chime in. Foreign policy direction. Sure, um, right. Um, so uh, it, it's very, uh, there, there are very few signs that uh, Xi Jinping will change his foreign fo uh, policy focus. Uh, competition with the United States will remain um, pretty much central to whatever he does on foreign policy front. And, you know, um, interestingly, um, you know, based on my conversations with Chinese diplomats and, um, you know, they're saying that um, basically it's very hard for us to make any changes because we have been left with no breathing room. Uh, I, I guess the American side probably feels the same way. So, um, you know, we're really expecting a more assertive, aggressive you know, stance in terms of uh, China's relationship with the uh, U.S. and other Western countries. And as you mentioned earlier, Kaiser, uh, she's first trip, right, in nearly three years is to go to Central Asia and to potentially meet with Putin. What does that say to us, right? It's uh, at a time when Putin, you know, is suffering set setbacks uh, in Ukraine. And, uh Chinese, uh, if if not anything else, but symbolically, it's, it's a very strong statement that this alignment uh, Beijing has had with uh, Moscow is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Damien, I'm um, specifically, let me ask you, um, you know, I, I think that, that a lot of us have, uh, with our interlocutors in China have concluded that Beijing has basically decided now that irrespective of who sits in the White House or what parties in power in Congress, the position of the United States is that we will constrain and contain, box in China, thwart its rise, and that uh, that isn't a partisan matter at all. And so we there's zero trust. Do you sense that there's there's uh, with Xi taking his new third term that there's any uh, possibility for at least a sort of you know uh, a, a détente or a little, let alone a rapprochement? Well, this is clearly a two-way street, right? So it's sure. not just entirely up to Beijing and it's not entirely up to Washington. Uh, and I, uh, I would say that I think both sides, uh, to kind of piggyback up, off of what Ling Ling uh, has just said, is that I don't think either side thinks sort of just a purely bilateral approach is, is really going to be effective or is really going to work. 
So it's going to have to be some sort of multilateral on both sides. And the question is just what sort of specific coalitions and groupings are we going to see? Uh, whether, you know, this Russia, uh, this Beijing Moscow thing actually endures or is just more fleeting. Uh, what kind of coalitions are we going to have, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, on sort of the U.S. led side? And it's entirely possible they're going to get a lot of uh, a sort of a heterodox set of groupings dealing with different kinds of problems. For example, on um, security is going to look kind of probably quite different than on, let, let, let's say, supply chains. Right. Uh, because, you know, uh, there's just some some contradictory uh, elements in terms of the economic side versus the security side of things. Uh, I think on the economic side, I'll just uh, spend uh, just 30 seconds on that. I think the key question there is, um, you know, if the idea is some sort of modest selective decoupling, whichever term of endearment you want to use, uh, I think I think the question is, uh, how do you realistically substitute a Chinese manufacturing sector that's about $4 trillion, which is about the size of the German GDP, right? That seems pretty formidable. Um, so when people ask, when people talk about decoupling, I usually wanna ask, well, okay, find the credible viable substitute to China. Is it Mexico? Is it Indonesia? What is it? And if we can't have a good answer to that, it's gonna be very, it's actually gonna be very tough in reality to do it well. And to, right. and to not do it disruptively. So I think I'll just leave it at that. We've been talking about decoupling for four years. And in each of those four years, our trade deficit with China has increased. And not <laughs> right. Kendra, I, I've often bemoaned the way that, I mean, maybe it's ironic that I'm saying this at a future security forum, but a way the way that, that in the U.S. <clears throat> we've tended in recent years to just view everything China through the single lens of national security, to view China's motives as focused entirely on great power competition, you know, in the same way that ours are. Uh, um, and and how, that can really steer us, I think, into a lot of wrong ideas about Beijing uh, and what Beijing actually intends to do. Um, Kendra, can you offer us some good examples from your world, the world of you know tech policy in China, of how we sometimes misinterpret or or mischaracterize the way that China thinks and and what the the the, the actual motives of, of what they do are, and, and uh, they're not maybe all always quite as sinister as we imagine. Uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, one of the biggest misconceptions I see in my day to day work is a kind of widespread misunderstanding about the way that Beijing is approaching data security and data mm -hmm. policy. Um, one of those misconceptions is kind of based on the premise that we tend to think of China as a country obsessed with information control, right? Because information control means power and the CCP's primary objective is staying in power. And so, you know, by that reasoning, it kind of naturally follows that the same logic would apply to the way the country is approaching data security, right? From this opaque and kind of irrationally protectionist perspective only. Um, and of course, to a certain extent, that's true. The CCP does love its control over information. And from the outside, on a surface level, that rationale seems to, to kind of bear out right now, right? Story after story over the last couple of years outlines how China is cutting off access to Chinese data, shutting down access to shipping data, forcing companies to localize their data in China, preventing the export of data, right? So we get this national security only message. But the fascinating part is from Beijing's perspective, the long-term goals are completely different, right? China sees the locking down of some types of sensitive data as the first step towards enabling a robust international data trade, right? Beijing very clearly hmm. articulated its intentions to kind of turn China into this global epicenter of data trading, right? To take China's vast data wealth, right? By some estimates, China generates like more data than any other country in the world uh, and, ca and capitalize on that wealth. Right. But, but 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 the key there, as fine as China, as far as, you know, Chinese policymakers are concerned, is that the law has not yet identified which data is safe to trade and which data isn't safe to trade. So okay, we've only got one more minute, unfortunately, and I do have one question I want to ask. And, you know, we hear all the time now yeah. that we mustn't try to out China, China, right? Uh, yes. That there's, you know, and, and I, I think that's that's broadly true. I mean, I think there's many examples uh, where we, we, we have tried and we look bad in doing so. But at yeah. the same time, I mean, there's obviously a lot of things that China is doing that are laudable and that maybe we ought to, to maybe seek to emulate. Kendra, give me an example of, of, of some of the things that China is doing in the realm of, 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 of you know, the, the, the digital world where maybe we ought to learn something. I mean, aren't they curbing their uh, tech platforms in a way that we've been unable to? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, because we have time, I'll trunk, we don't have a lot of time, I'll truncate this, but one of the most interesting policies that came out of China in the last year we're studying is their policy on recommendation algorithms. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. It was really revolutionary. One of the things that it does um, is it requires tech companies to allow consumers to opt out of being targeted by algorithms, right? Not let e-commerce sites or social sites use your user data to serve you content or product recommendations, for example. Uh, it requires platforms to show consumers the keywords that are being used to target them, which is, you know, my colleague turned to me and said, oh, God, what if Facebook thinks I'm fat? You know, we don't know what decisions the machines have made about us. Right. Uh, and it forbids the use of algorithms to conduct price discrimination, break the law, uh, et cetera. So we're actually looking right now very at a very weird and unique situation where Chinese consumers and gig workers have more rights on the Chinese Internet. Uh, at least in terms of consumption and privacy than American citizens do. And that's a concern to me. Well, unfortunately, uh, I've, I've lost two of my guests already. I mean, they're, uh, they had to hop off. We had the hard stop and uh, appreciate everyone. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get to more of the audience questions, but we very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kendra. And yes. thanks to, to, to Ling Ling and to Damien.